Hello, this is Michael Altos. We are starting a section on neurophysiology. This is recording part one. A quick review of some structure and organization of the nervous system. This is material we've discussed somewhat in the pharmacology curriculum. And we'll start with neurons, which are cells that transmit electrical impulses. Neurons can be quite long and make connections with hundreds or even thousands of other neurons. Parts of a neuron include the axon. The axon takes information away from the cell body. Dendrites, which are um, structures that bring information into the cell body. And then the synapse, which is the space between two neurons where they communicate. As we know, axons can be myelinated or unmyelinated. We see the myelin sheath surrounding the axon in this diagram. And then nerve fibers uh, are then created by bundles of axons, which have myelin sheath and are surrounded by endoneurium. Then they're in bundles, which are surrounded by perineurium. And finally, the entire nerve is surrounded by epineurium. Nerves also have vasculature within them in order to give supply to the nerves. And just this diagram that we've seen again before of myelinated and unmyelinated nerves and the Schwann cell that provides the myelin. Going back to the level of the individual nerve cell, we talked about a synapse where two nerves uh, communicate. There are different kinds of synapses. The most common is a chemical synapse where a nerve impulse, that would be the action potential, travels along the neuron until it gets to the end and a neurotransmitter is released. There are synaptic vesicles that contain neurotransmitter and the action potential causes that vesicle to fuse with the cell membrane and release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic space. Examples of neurotransmitters could be acetylcholine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, histamine, GABA, glycine, serotonin, or glutamate, just to name several. The neurotransmitter travels across the synapse and then binds to a receptor on the postsynaptic terminal. There are many different uh, ways that this can happen. The neurotransmitter can bind to some sort of an ion receptor, allowing ions to pass through. It could bind to a second messenger system where it hits a receptor, and that causes a second chemical messenger, a different neurotransmitter, inside the cell to be activated. There are excitatory receptors that open things like sodium or potassium channels. Rather, they open sodium channels or they close potassium or chloride channels. And there are inhibitory receptors that open chloride or potassium channels. So all of these different combinations and permutations are available for each and every synapse between any two nerves. After the uh, neurotransmitter has done its job, it can be metabolized in the synaptic cleft, or it could undergo reuptake back into the presynaptic terminal. It can be metabolized in the synaptic cleft, or it could undergo reuptake back into the presynaptic terminal and form a new vesicle for the next action potential that comes down. There is another kind of synapse, which is an electrical synapse. We see this in um, electrical tissues like heart or smooth muscle. And we have these gap junction channels which physically bind one neuron to the next. And the nerve impulse travels along the neuron to the gap junction and transmits the action potential to the next neuron. Now let's review some anatomy of the brain. The brain is surrounded by the meninges, three layers of tissue that cover the brain and the spinal cord. The first layer is called the dura. This layer lines the inside of the entire skull and creates little folds. These folds include the falcs, which separates the right and left half of the brain, and the tentorium, which separates the upper and lower parts of the brain. The second layer is called the arachnoid, a thin and delicate membrane made of tissue and blood vessels that covers the entire brain. The space between the dura and the arachnoid membranes is called the subdural space. The third layer is called the pia, this layer of meninges is closest to the surface of the brain. It has many blood vessels that reach deep into the surface of the brain. And the space between the arachnoid and the pia is called the subarachnoid space. This space contains the cerebrospinal fluid, which flows from the ventricles, as we will discuss later on. The brain stem is the lower extension of the brain connected to the spinal cord. 
many simple or primitive functions that are essential for survival are located here. The brainstem actually consists of three separate structures, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. The midbrain controls ocular motion, the pons is involved in coordination of eye and facial movements, facial sensation, hearing, and a balance, and the medulla oblongata is in charge of control of breathing, blood pressure, heart rhythms, and swallowing. The reticular activating system is also found in the midbrain, the pons, the medulla, and part of the thalamus. This system is in charge of levels of wakefulness, attention, and sleep patterns. Destruction of these regions of the brainstem will cause brain death. Without these key functions, humans cannot survive. Cranial nerves 3 through 12 also originate in the brainstem. The cerebrum is the major portion of the brain. It is divided into left and right hemispheres, separated by the longitudinal fissure, and joined at the corpus callosum. In general, the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, and vice versa. The left hemisphere typically controls language and speech. In a subset of left-handed patients, you may find these centers on the right side. The right hemisphere typically controls visual and spatial processing. The surface of the cerebrum contains billions of neurons that form the cerebral cortex. This is also called the gray matter. Beneath the surface, there are connecting fibers, which form the white matter. Each of the two hemispheres has four lobes, the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes. The frontal lobe controls voluntary movement, speech, intellectual, and behavioral functions. The prefrontal cortex is responsible for memory, intelligence, concentration, temper, and personality. And the premotor cortex controls eye and head movements and sense of orientation. Broca's area is in the frontal lobe. It is responsible for language motor production. Usually it's on the left side of the brain. A patient with Broca's aphasia, or expressive aphasia, will have the inability to produce language, either spoken or written language, although comprehension usually remains intact. The parietal lobe is responsible for interpreting signals received from other areas of the brain, such as vision, hearing, motor, sensory, and memory. The temporal lobe, located on the side of the brain, at about ear level, on the right side controls visual memory and recognition of objects and faces. On the left side controls verbal memory and language. Wernicke's area is in the temporal lobe. A patient with Wernicke's aphasia, or receptive aphasia, will have difficulty understanding written and spoken language. They will be able to generate fluent speech with effortless output, but often it is gibberish and lacks any content or meaning. meaning. Near the rear of the temporal lobe are the controls for interpretation of other people's emotions and reactions. Finally, the occipital lobe, located at the back of the brain, receives and processes visual information, colors, and shapes. The right side interprets visual signals from the left visual space and vice versa. Other components of the cerebrum include the limbic system, which is involved in emotions. This includes the hypothalamus, part of the thalamus, the amygdala, which is active in producing aggressive behavior, and the hippocampus, which plays a role in the ability to remember new information. The pineal gland, which grows behind the third ventricle, plays a role in light and dark cycles and in sexual maturation. The thalamus serves as a relay station for almost all information that comes and goes to the cortex.
pain sensation, attention, and alertness. The basal ganglia are clusters of nerve cells that surround the thalamus. The pituitary gland at the base of the brain, behind the nose, is responsible for secretion and control of many hormones, as discussed in the endocrine section. The hypothalamus sends messages to the pituitary gland, handling information from the autonomic nervous system and controlling appetite, sexual behavior, sleeping, and regulating body temperature, emotions, secretion of hormones, and movement. The cerebellum, which means the little brain, is located at the back of the brain, behind the occipital lobes. The cerebellum fine-tunes motor activity and movement, including rapid and repetitive actions. It helps maintain posture, sense of balance or equilibrium, and gait. Moving on to the spinal cord. The spinal cord consists of vertebral bones and intervertebral discs. There are seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five sacral vertebrae. And the spinal cord runs through the hollow rings of the vertebral bones that form the spinal canal. The spinal cord is surrounded by spinal fluid, which is contained inside the subarachnoid or intrathecal space. Spinal nerves exit at each vertebral level. The nerves exit above their vertebra at the cervical level, but below their vertebra starting at T1. The spinal cord ends at L1 a little bit lower in children. Below this, this level, the nerve roots form not a spinal cord, but the cauda equina, which means the horse's tail. When you do a spinal anesthetic or a spinal puncture, it should be done at or below this level in order to avoid injury to the spinal cord itself. The function of the spinal cord is to serve as a conduit between the brain and the peripheral tissues. It transmits sensory information to the CNS, transmits motor information from the CNS, transmits autonomic information to and from other organs, and controls reflex movements. Looking back at the spinal nerves, we see that each spinal nerve innervates a segment of skin called a dermatome. It's important for you to know some of the key dermatomes. C5 to T1 cover the upper extremity. The T4 nerve root innervates the level of the nipples. The T7 nerve root, the xiphoid process at the bottom of the sternum. T10 is the umbilicus. T12 to L1 is the inguinal crease. S4 to 5 is the perianal region. And here in this figure, you can see the spinal cord. You can see the spinal nerves. C1 through C8, C8 coming out below the C7 vertebra, and after that we have the T1 vertebra with the T1 spinal nerve above it. At the bottom you can see the cauda equina hanging down below the level of L1, which is the end of the spinal cord. Above the cervical spine, when we get to the brainstem, we can start talking about the cranial nerves. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. They exit from the base of the brain and the brainstem. So this is where the spinal cord would attach to the base of the brainstem. And there's um, where nerve 11 is and moving our way up all the way to nerve 1. You do not have to memorize all of these nerves, but it would be a good idea to be familiar with them and I've put all the information in a table for your reference. So we can see the name of each nerve as well as its number. We can see what it innervates, whether it's a sensory, a motor, or both, and what its primary functions are. That's it for, for our introduction. We'll stop here, and please let me know if you have any questions.